Hi, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Saturday of A Type I. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, of course, Google, who is our main sponsor and will be allowing us to post recordings of uh, all these talks, or most of these talks up on YouTube in a couple of weeks. So I'd like to introduce Shrenik, who is a typographer, type designer, and teacher based in Brooklyn, um, and he's originally from Mumbai. So without further ado, let's uh, take it away. Hi, oh, I also see Justin uh, commenting, um, and thank you, C, for the introduction. Um, my name is Shrenik. Um, I am, like C mentioned, originally from Mumbai, but I currently live in Brooklyn, where I have been working as a designer, typographer, and now I currently teach at the Shillington School of Design in New York. Um, um, aside from my design practice, I'm also a musician, um, and I find it interesting to find overlaps between my worlds of music and design. And in this presentation, I'm gonna focus mostly on the type side of things and see how it intertwines with the music world, especially when the business of, of uh, both these avenues are concerned. Uh, before I begin, I would like to say hello to everybody and thank you for joining in. Thank you to A Type I for giving me this opportunity to share my work and a little bit of experience and knowledge that I have encountered in designing typefaces for the last decade or so. So my work is rooted in typography. Um, it also extends itself to disciplines like branding, publication design, typeface design, designing for music, um, exhibition design, so on and so forth. So I tend to be very multidisciplinary in the work. And some of the clients that I've worked with include the Type Directors Club in New York, Apollo Theater in New York as well, Library of Congress in Washington, DC, Skrull Records, which is an independent jazz label in Brooklyn, uh, New York. These are a, this is a structural overview of some of the typeface work that I have done. We will talk about this in depth later on, but the idea is to always be evolving um, as a typeface designer and not stick to one style. Um, so on the left, we are seeing something um, that's uh, more sort of playful, bold, uh, sans serif, contrasting with something on the top right, which is a three-weight typeface that's based on singular skeleton, uh, but has different weights and, and widths. The one at the bottom is, a as of now, it's a single weight. Uh, humanist uh, grotesque typeface called Bird Grotesque. It was done with uh, my former MICA classmate, Potch, who is speaking at 11 p.m. tonight. And then on the right, this is a work in progress. It's, uh, it's an untitled typeface as of now. Um, so just exploring the structural nature, that's how I usually approach typeface design. And once I sort of find unity in the structures, I really tend to pull things together into a cohesive uh, typepiece. So this presentation, uh, it's about thriving as an independent typeface designer, you know, in an industry that's inundated with type foundries and type being so universal uh, with more and more people getting into type design. Uh, I just wanted to shed light on the business side of things because I believe that there isn't a lot of information out there. So it, it's really basically about my journey as an independent typeface designer and some of the findings that I have realized uh, in, in due course. So let's go back all the way to the beginning. I'm originally from India, as I've mentioned before, specifically from Mumbai. If you haven't been, it looks something like this. So it's, a, it's basically a hodgepodge of different things. Um, you know, you get blue skies um, once a week, it's a pleasing feeling. There's like chaos, there's confusion, there's also beauty um, in that. So uh, my parents are fairly middle class. My dad is now a retired, uh, you know, he's a stay at home, best friends with my dog uh, kind of a person at this point, uh, but he used to work six days a week 
you know, nine to five typical, um, grew up the ladder in a private company in the service sector. And my mom was a teacher. She became a housewife as soon as I was born. And my parents basically left me to my own devices when it comes to figuring things out with what I really want to do, which has in course of time uh, become a good asset in really figuring out the life path whenever I feel like I'm stuck uh, on something. So I was a very, I wouldn't say intelligent in terms of studies. I was, I was intelligent in a lot of respects, but studies, I could, I could retain things and I had a fascination and inclination towards technology. Um, and I ended up picking information technology as my major in my undergrad, only to find out that I wasn't really happy with what I was doing. So, um, over the four years, there were you know bits and pieces of, of of happiness, but more often than not, it was a very gruesome journey. However, the silver lining in that was me discovering the UI side of things and how different elements sat on screen, especially typography and how different typefaces interact with one another on screen. This was way back in 2012. And that to me was my introduction to design and it was via type, unlike you know with print or any other avenues, uh, which a lot of designers uh, are used to when they first start out with design. So I began thinking uh, and learning more about type. Um, my first introduction to the structure and anatomy of type was via this book called uh, Anatomy of Type by Ellen Lupton, who then became my graduate program director uh, at the Maryland Institute College of Art, where I studied graphic design. And basically, I would just sketch, explore the letter forms, explore the different relationships between different styles of lettering, be it retro, be it hand, handwritten, be it sans, be it textural, and adapted itself to screen. So when I was applying to my grad school portfolio in 2013, 2014, I realized that I didn't, did not have a typeface piece in and I wanted to get one in. So I designed I, my first typeface. I taught myself how to do that using practices that I would not even consider right now having learned typeface design uh, professionally for a little over five years. Um, these were all designed in Illustrator, later imported into Font Lab. It was, it's a geometric sans serif typeface, my first ever one, put it out there. It was inspired by Futura and a lot of neutral looking geometric, uh, neutral contrast typefaces. And these are a few specimens um, of, of, of the typeface set in both weights. So as luck would have it, I found that the typeface that I put up for free for personal use was receiving a lot of traction. So I started getting attention from different blogs. Creative Block was one that really picked it up in uh, July 15th, 2014 um, as a standout font for headlines. You know, then it snowballed and it has over the course of history uh, kind of become a favorite typeface or one of the favorite typefaces when it comes to titles and headlines and so on and so forth. I was later um, represented by Adobe India uh, and then they supported my work and shared my work. It was also featured on how design. And then finally Behance featured the type in their 2014 year in review, which was sent out to all the members of Behance uh, back in the day. Um, so this really opened up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities for me as an independent typeface designer. I was still a student then um, who had had zero experience working with type, but getting this sort of attraction uh, really led uh, or really created a platform for me to actually explore the journey a little bit more um, and focus on the business side of things. So. I mentioned that the typeface got traction right immediately, but it did not really happen by itself. Looking back five or so years since I first put it out, there were certain release strategies that my 23 year old thought you know, would work and some of them did, some of them didn't. 
So in this chapter, I would like to shed light on um, some of the business practices that I followed that really helped push the typeface uh, with a little bit of luck as well, obviously, and timing. So I, I made two weights. I designed two weights in total, the regular weight and the lightweight. I released one weight for free. So I presented both my weights, but I only released one weight for free. And it was free for personal use. I stated explicitly that commercial use requires licensing of the font for appropriate usage. Um, what that meant was if people liked the typeface, they would support the cause. And back then, um, I was under the impression, you know, if 10 people end up buying it and, and, and paying me the price that I asked for, it's going to help me pay for my grad school, which is uh, a very expensive deal in the United States to begin with. Self-promoted both weights. So I reached out to design blogs myself, submitted pitches to Tumblr blogs, uh, and basically emailed people who were accepting open submissions. And a couple of people accepted it, especially just snowballed um, via a couple of Tumblr blogs. I remember designers of Tumblr being one in 2013. I think it's defunct now, but it used to be a massive design uh, blog back in the day. Same with designclever.co.uk. And it just started getting traction on Tumblr. Then I saw it uh, landed on Pinterest and it, it just snowballed from there. So a little bit of self-promotion also helped uh, to sort of get that typeface off the ground um, and get it in people's psyche. Maintained pricing on a sliding scale. My intention for designing this typeface was not really to make money. I was like, if people pay me, you know, whatever I ask for, whether it be a floor price or a ceiling price, I'm going to be happy with it because that's really not my primary intention. I just want to put it out there and see what it can do to people or how people can find good use for it. So I realized that determining the floor and ceiling values for pricing when it comes to designing typefaces is crucial because then once you have accepted those values, whatever money you get for the typeface, you know, whether it's 20 bucks, if that's your floor value, whether it's 200 bucks, whether it's your ceiling value, you're going to be happy with it. So this values or these values become especially crucial. Included licensing info, contact information in the download package. So the call to action for the free version that I put up on my Behance profile enabled people to reach out to me in case they wanted to buy the license. Um, because when this typeface landed on different blogs, people retained the README file, which had the licensing information. Had I not included it, chances are uh, it would not have received as much traction. I, I, I wouldn't have been able to um, successfully sort of promote it from a financial standpoint. And then these were some of the results and observations and case studies that were that were a reaction or a consequence of the business strategy that I had uh, for that typeface. I realized people love to try fonts before they buy, right? I mentioned that typeface is just like fashion. Like we all go to stores like Zara um, or any other store or thrift stores. We love trying things before we spend our money on it and typefaces are no different. Um, a lot of websites back in the day did not really have the try before you buy feature. Uh, which I think now it's a it's a it's a common place. Like any type foundry you go to to buy a typeface, they will have, you know, you, they will have a input field an input field where you could basically preview the typeface and then determine whether you want to spend your money or not. So this was something that I determined by giving uh, a weight out for free for personal use. Quite a few people like to support independent artists and designers. Um, having never really tackled with the business side of things before, I had no idea of the reception you know, that I was going to get from people, small businesses, and even corporations alike when it came to responding uh, from a financial standpoint. And with the emails that I get are so heartwarming, it's, it's such a refreshing feeling to know 
that people like to support artists when they explicitly mention that in their emails. The sliding scale of the pricing was effective. I have been reached out by nonprofits, students, churches, corporations, and everyone has different pockets of affordability. And having the pricing set to a sliding scale has really helped me open my work to a broad demographic. So this was one of the key points as well. The users who enjoyed the regular version, they also bought the license to obtain the light version. So <clears throat> because I didn't give everything away at once, the ones who really enjoyed working with the regular version, they were like, oh, let me try what the light version has. Let me see how it you know, uh, interplays with the regular version and purchase the license for the same. So that actually helped. And then a few more observations from the different side of business. So obviously when your work gets traction, different people will reach out to you. I was reached out by several foundries. Most of them did not really have any good uh, financial deals to offer to designers. Like some of them, they were like, hey, we'll give you a 20% cut for your work and we'll take the 80% profit. Um, and I was like, no way, this is not going to happen. Like I've put in all my, all my effort into this and I'm not letting you take 80% of the cut. So in case if you end up, you know, uh, distributing your rights to your work to an external type foundry, if a deal like this uh, is being put to the table, I, I would consider this a red flag. Um, typically, people usually pay about 50-50, but once again, it depends on the type foundry and the nature of the people working at, the, at these foundries. Handling the distribution myself meant that I had to maintain information about every single purchase. This included their names, this included their emails, this included the date of purchase. This included the license number for each and every purchase. Uh, it also included the amount paid by every person. So I basically made a spreadsheet, which I still use uh, six years later. Additionally, I also designed a custom license certificate for everyone. So there wasn't an automated system in place wherein people could actually click a link, buy it. You know, there was that, that personal interaction uh, between the buyer and the seller that helped from the business standpoint. And finally, I had to sell the, send the files personally to the users of my typeface instead of adopting an automated system. So what I mean by that is in the readme file, I had mentioned that even though it's free, if you'd like to use it for commercial purposes, here's my email, drop me a line and we'll get the communication forward. So people usually respond with, a heartwarming message about how they love your work or their intent to use it. They inquire about the licensing and the pricing. And then I would personalize every message depending on what the inquiry was for. And that really helped retain the, the customers who were reaching out because what I found that over 80% of the people who had reached out inquiring about the typeface uh, or the license for the same ended up buying it. So that the old strategy you know, the good old practice of maintaining a direct relationship with your customers worked in the digital realm. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful practice to have when thinking of, of your work from a business standpoint, no matter what you're selling. You know, it's like my mom would go to our local milk shop and, and you know, we did not really change um, our dairy for basically 15 years, just because of the one-to-one -one relationship that we had with the person. And obviously the milk was great, uh, but it was also about the relationship that we had with uh, the, the, se the, the seller of, of milk. So it's a wonderful feeling to know how your work is being used and have that one-to-one -one interaction with your customers. So keep that in mind when it comes to the business side of things. I don't think there is a substitute for that. Like automation will help you get things quicker, but just the idea, just that human interaction, you know, in a world where everything is so digitized, just that emotion and, and handcrafting everything and, and, and personalizing uh, the communication goes a long way in retaining uh, people and having them come back to your work. And these are some of the messages that I, you know, usually get on a daily basis. I get about five to six of them uh, every day. So this was one from a student 
they had been using my typeface since 2017. They had used it, used it once as a student. And then now that they could afford it, they were willing to pay me for, uh, for my work, which is a wonderful feeling as an artist and a designer. And another thing that they mentioned after I responded to their email was that they really appreciated me having the pricing on a sliding scale. Another good thing uh, that I sort of realize is when people share how they're using the typeface, it's, it's a lovely thing. It's like, you know, you've created something for a demographic and then you see that demographic use it for 50 different reasons. And it's, it's a beautiful feeling as an artist. So whenever I get emails like this, um, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful feeling knowing your customers. Um, so this was from uh, a little mom and pop wine co cocktail company in, in, in London. Um, and they inquired if I was still a student and, and, and they were of the opinion that it's the right thing to recognize people's work. Aside from small businesses and you know nonprofits and students using my work, this typeface uh, was also featured as the title typeface of the NBC's show Colony, CBS's show Blood and Treasure, which is currently premiering on Amazon Prime. So all of these little montages of places and years and dates, they are set in Adam. Mission Impossible did an Uber campaign back in 2018. This was Mission Impossible 4. And they used uh, their typeface, they used my typeface in their promo campaign. And the last use being Ad Astra uh, starring Brad Pitt, this was last year. So you never really know like where your work can go once you put it out there and you give it sort of enough weight and push it to the people. Um, this is an important part uh, because this dives or this basically introduces my worlds of music and, and, and type. Because I did all the groundwork myself, maintained a spreadsheet, um, I have access to an audience. And now that I'm in a band, when we have music, when we have releases coming up, I can use the same business principles that I applied you know, uh, five or so years ago as a 23 year old to promote the music, the basics remain the same. The challenges are also the same, which is basically how do you maintain that one-to-one -one relationship with your, your customers? Um, in this case, when, it, when, it, when we talk about the music side of things, it's, uh, it's your listeners, right? So I created a landing page like over time, I've evolved the way I deliver the typeface, or at least the free version to people. And I created a landing page telling that I'm, I'm a designer and also have a band on the side and that, you know, uh, you should go check out this music video. Uh, and I would love to know, you know, what you think about it. Um, so, yeah, I also employed a marketing strategy that ties in my music and the design just to sort of introduce the already existing audience that I have in my design world to the music world. So these are some of the comments that I see on the band's YouTube channel. They're not just in English, they're also in Spanish. And thanks to Google Translate, I'm able to translate them and respond back in Spanish because I don't know Spanish. Um, yeah, and this was an interesting comment because they thought it was an interesting marketing piece wherein you know a designer was putting their music works in the same space where they put their design work and then when they were extracting the file, they had another surprise. Uh, and people tend to like the music, which is great. I've obviously received quite a few backlashes because everybody's not going to uh, enjoy, you know, you sort of promoting your music as well. But the point is that there is no shame in self-promotion. It always works out at the end of the day. Um, so that is basically what I have learned publishing my work, selling my work by myself. Um, and these are some of the typefaces that I have designed uh, over the course of years. So this one was a student project at the Maryland Institute College of Art, wherein we had to design a typeface to solve a problem. The problem in this case was 
the typefaces that appeared on the World Cup jerseys representing the names and the countries, they had a limitation imposed by the International Cricket Council because of which some of the typefaces were stretched or scaled disproportionately. So for instance, if you had something like South Africa or New Zealand, because it employs more letters than something like India, which is very short, the former had to be stretched to sort of make way for that space uh, according to the guidelines. So that I thought was a big issue and being a type nerd that I am, um, I thought, why not try a concept typeface where you actually take into consideration the guidelines, then design the typeface for it, and then use use case scenarios to see if it actually fits uh, the limitations. So the idea was that of unification and contrast. The unification was achieved by having the names and the countries in the same type. However, the contrast was achieved by having a different representation of the numbers for every country. Uh, and these were inspired by different things. I remember this being inspired by uh, Devnagari calligraphy of India for India, South African rugby team for South Africa, this was for England, so on and so forth. So it, it was merely a concept. It never really was intended uh, as a pitch to be the typeface for the World Cup. I was just having fun as a student. This was another typeface that I had developed uh, for about a year and a half back in 2016 and it has six weights. Um, it's a sans serif uh, typefaces with really sort of angular edges. And I wanted to try out uh, lowercase letters as well because I hadn't experimented with those before. And I used Robofont, which I had uh, learned under the tutelage of uh, Tal Lemming, who is an amazing typeface designer and a wonderful teacher during my time at MICA in Baltimore. So I was just testing out, this is like a specimen that really shows the use of the type at various sizes and how the different weights are applicable uh, for different sizes. This is another one called Bird Grotesque. Um, I introduced this earlier on as well. Um, this is meant to be a multi-family typeface. God knows when this is going to be finished, but currently we have one weight finished. Um, it has about 315 glyphs. It was really inspired by several grotesque typefaces. So when my collaborator Potch, who was also my Mica classmate at the time in 2017, when we were looking to use typefaces for our projects, we sort of found that we liked different things across different uh, grotesque typefaces. And we were like, how about we get inspired by what ideas we like and try to create try and create a typeface family of our own that incorporates such ideas. And, and it's basically like a hodgepodge of things we love. And this is the result. So this is a regular weight for it. Um, we intend to start working on additional weights sometime next year, but as schedules have it, he's currently in Thailand. I'm currently in Brooklyn. Um, it has been difficult to figure out the logistics of things. Um, Another typeface called Chamberlain, inspired by uh, my favorite drummer, Jimmy Chamberlain's uh, drumming abilities. Um, so the idea was to have a singular skeleton. And then based on that skeleton, you would have multiple widths of the typeface. So on the right, you see a condensed version of it. On the left, you see an expanded, sort of high contrast version of the same typeface. Uh, and this was merely indicating the ideas of Chamberlain, who's a fantastic drummer. You know, he, he can play soft as a feather and hard as a, you know, monster or a machine. So that's that was something, that was the inspiration. Just like having the same skeleton, but expanding it into different realms and seeing where it goes structurally and formally. And this was, uh, the, this is the normal contrast weight for the same, which is meant to be a wide sans. Manicules, I love manicules. So uh, some of his drum gestures sort of made it into uh, the type manicules. And then finally, this is currently, I would not call this a typeface because I haven't, it's basically a lettering piece. I'm working on a typeface inspired by this lettering piece. It was made for one of our shows in last November and I really liked uh, the structure of it. And I was like, why not convert it into the typeface? So 
that was basically it from my presentation. I really want to thank everyone for taking the time and being here. And thank you, A Tai Pi, for hosting me and letting me share my work. Um, I see that there are a few questions in the chat. Yeah, we have um, one question. Well, there's um, some kudos from Erin McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. um, I love that you did the sales. I'm going to read these out because um, people who see the video later won't have access to these. Absolutely. You did the sales manually. That is so awesome. Kudos to you. I'm inspired to do that now. How it worked for you? Have you met other type designers trying the same approach? Uh, yes and no. Yes, because um, my type design teacher, Tal Lemming, he has his own foundry type supply and he manages basically the business side of things himself. So there are people there like independently uh, owned and employed type foundries with two to three people that really handle the business side themselves. I'm pretty sure Fair Jones, uh, which is a massive typeface foundry, it's not uh, an individual, a well-reputed well foundry, I'm pretty sure they also, like when it comes to foundries, they will have their accounts department do, do the work for them. But as individuals, um, I haven't really met a lot of people. Um, and thank you for your kind comments. Yeah, I think it, I think it is very unique. Um, I especially starting out as a student, um, a lot of students release their font um, as a free font and uh, almost forget about it. But to have a business strategy around that, um, which has panned out, I think is, is pretty uh, it's, unique. Yeah. And I would also like to, I think, shed light on the fact that, you know, I was a 23 year old with zero business knowledge. I was just basically looking out for myself in the sense that I did not really want to give everything away for free. Yep. There was a little bit of a feedback mechanism wherein, you know, if you like something, then, you know, if you pay me and support my work, it's going to help me with the education. That was basically the gist of it. And it somehow seemed to have worked. And only now that I'm looking back at it, I realized that some of the practices that I did employ subconsciously work and, you know, some others don't. Yeah. No, I think it, that it's great. Um, we, there was another question: is How do you work? At, how do you establish the pricing of your typefaces? My answer to that would be establishing the intent for sales. Like, you know, what do you what do you want to sell it? Or why do you want to sell it? It's like, are you getting looking to get rich, or you know, are you looking to buy Armani suit? Um, a lot of things essentially go into pricing of, of your work, right? Um, I would suggest knowing that as an independent typeface designer, chances are your work won't be recognized. Like that has been the case for a lot of my other typefaces. It's like they haven't been as big as the other, uh, the, the one that's um, Adam that's already out there. So understanding that whatever you get will help you maintain your practice, whether it's 40 bucks, whether it's 60 bucks, and obviously through conscious business strategies, through conscious, you know, one-on-one -on -one with your audience and self-promotion, you will get there over time. But pricing it in a way that, you know, if you end up with three buyers um, in a month, that's gonna, that's gonna be okay. And also looking at what the competitors are charging because there is quality typeface design work out there at a nominal price. So unless and until, you know, you're like the most reputed foundry, um, I'm not encouraging people to lowball themselves. I'm also not encouraging people to highball themselves. It's just about knowing what's what the market price is, and also knowing what you will be comfortable uh, getting for your work, if if that helps. So, and I think that's also an experiential thing. Experiential thing. The more you do, uh, the better you get at pricing as well. Yeah. So there's a, a, almost a follow-up question about um, to, if you could explain the sliding scale. Is it pay what you want or were there specific prices for different groups of customers, nonprofits, small, medium, enterprise businesses? That's an excellent question, Justin. Um, so sliding scale, there are two kinds of licenses for that typeface, right? There is one for desktop use, there's one for web use. Both of them have a sliding scale, meaning you can pay what you want as long as it's within these floor and ceiling values. Yep. And, you know, sometimes people just pay the bare minimum. Sometimes people pay all of it. 
And then to add to that, there are certain special licenses. Like, you know, if, if you anticipate your work getting used in a movie, yeah. you have to account for that and make sure that you are mentioning that in your emails that, hey, if you actually want to use this in a production where 2 million eyeballs are going to be looking at it, you have to like price your license accordingly. So determining um, the different kinds of license becomes essential. Yep. And a lot of it comes from just like going to the Thai foundries and seeing, you know, what sort of licenses they're offering and where you can use them. Yeah. Doing your research accordingly. Great. I hope that helps. One more question. Um, a lot of designers I know really struggle with the business strategy side of things. Have you, oh, let's scroll up. Have you considered becoming a consultant for others? <laughs> it's early days, man. It's early days. I wish <laughs> it's early days. That would be, that would be a nice avenue though, um, to help people out with the business. Cause, um, my dad is really good at it, but my mom is very artistic. And sometimes I feel like I fall somewhere in the middle. Um, but maybe who knows in, in time, um, I would, I would love to sort of consider that, uh, but I have to be credible enough for that. And you wouldn't take 80%. Uh, no, I wouldn't. I, I would definitely not take 80%. I wouldn't be that kind of a consultant. <laughs> so um, there is feedback. This is, looks like it's a uh, great advice for graphic designers and other creatives as well, not just um, type designers. Um, how much time do you assign to the sales part? I wonder if sometimes it consumes all the time you have to do other things like design. Do you have some sort of uh, established time? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question, right? Um, I have learned in my practice that being a designer is just half the job if you're, you know, selling something. Like the business side of it is just as important. And because I don't really have an army of, you know, PR people, an army of, of other salespeople working for me, um, I have to make time. Like I have a day job where I teach eight to five. All of my free time now gets devoted to my music. And now I'm currently doing the business side of the music and the design as well. And it definitely eats up a lot of time. But once again, it's like if someone is actually paying you for your work to support your work, I think it's your obligation to make time for those people and, and give them what you've promised in the first place. So it will take a lot of time out of your schedule. But I think if you're practical and open minded about it, it's very achievable. And it's, it's a fun thing. Like, I love interacting with people. And, and, and especially, you know, when a church reaches out, it's like, oh, wow, this is where we are using and this is how we're going to use it to help people. That's like, wow. It's like people are using my work to actually, like, help other people. And that's a great feeling in that. Yeah. So someone is suggesting that you uh, it'd be better to be a type business coach. That's not oh, my goodness. So I, I do see a comment from my collaborator, Poch, who is also in here. Um, yeah, he commented, Posh, I can be a type business coach <laughs> and we can work on board grotesque together. Um, I would say I would love to talk about the business side of things, but to be very honest with you, I'm still figuring out the business process, which is why I sort of portrayed this as a journey, right? It's it's mm -hmm. once a journey. I it's I haven't really arrived at a destination. I don't think it's going to happen. Um so if I feel like it's going to help other people in the long run, I would first love to have enough experience under my belt mm -hmm. and, and use it all to help people without taking the 80% cut. Well, hopefully this presentation is maybe a, maybe start of that aspect of your career, but we'll see. Um, and yeah, no shame in self-promotion. That's what absolutely. I'm going to take away. That's the takeaway, guys. Like whatever you're promoting, there is absolutely no shame. And um Always look at the competition, always see what they're doing, analyze the pros and cons, and then do something that's differently. Because if you end up doing the same thing as the other people, chances are you will get lost in the noise and you don't want that. Right. Well, thank you again. That was a- oh, We have one more question, I guess. Uh, oh, yeah, there's one last, it looks like one last question. Would you change your strategy as an indie type designer if you were starting out today? Fantastic question. That, so, the strategies will obviously evolve with time. The approach remains the same. And my belief has always been like, if, if you're able to establish that one-to-one -one real interaction with your customers or with the users of your work, no matter how you achieve it, I think that will help you in the long run. Um, you know, as from a business standpoint, not just financially, but you know, um, 
just seeing or just getting the, the, the gratification of doing why you're doing it in the first place. Um, strategy wise, I would still keep some of the bits, you know, I wouldn't give everything away. I would really rely on self-promotion. I would do a lot more research on where the works are being promoted. Like what are some of the premium blogs and, and, and journalists when it comes to design who will accept your work as an independent designer and s publish it solely based on quality and also because they want to support your work. Yeah. So I think that's what I would do a little bit more um, if I were starting out today. Great. Okay, well, let's, um, I think we wrap it up here. If people want to head over to the Hangout Room, uh, it's 15 minutes before the next talk. Um, maybe Shranik will join us over there and we can have a face-to-face -face conversation. But again, thank you for your presentation. And thank I will, you yeah, I will join in later in the night. Uh, I have to, it's like 8.45 p.m. in New York and um, I have to go eat. But after that, I will come back and- yeah, Come out to the Hangout Room. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you everyone for your time. Thank you, Atai Pi, um, C, for posting me and, and having me here. And it was a wonderful treat to talk about work and interact with people. Great. Thank you. Thank you.